Welcome to the Powercast with Charlie Johnson. I'm one of the world's leading fitness and transformation coaches. I'm going to be providing you with the tools to build your ultimate body and mind. So, absolute pleasure today to have uh, James Wilkes from The Game Changers, which uh, is a very thought-provoking uh, documentary on Netflix uh, revolved around obviously, the vegan diet and your own personal experiences with it. Um, firstly, I, I found the documentary, I liked the way it was produced and the way you put the whole thing together was quite eloquently done. So um, congrats on that. It's an interesting watch. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. And that's a pleasure. And um, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and initially what switched you first over to becoming vegan? Yeah, no, totally. So, um, you know, I was training um, for a fight in the UFC. So my background was actually sort of combative as I trained the Navy SEALs, US Marshals, US Marines. That side, that those types of um, you know government bodies. I also taught self defense, so my focus was more on street self defense. But when I was turning thirty years old, I thought I don't want to look back and say, well, I could have fought in the UFC. So you know, I tried out for the Ultimate Fighter. I won that, um, and then I was you know I was training for a fight in the UFC. Got injured, tore ligaments in both of my knees. Started researching uh, the optimal diet for recovery and athletic performance, uh, looking at the peer reviewed literature, and that's when I came across a study about the Roman gladiators. So at the time, it was the only known for sure uh, burial site based on archeological and anthropological evidence that uh, it was a gladiator burial site. 68 gladiators, uh, 5,000 bones were analyzed, and they found that they were eating predominantly plants, right? So I thought, well, that can't be true. You have to have meat and animal products to be strong and healthy. I remember like a year before that walking into a restaurant and the chicken was spelt funny. I said, why is the chicken spelt like that? They said, well, it's made from plants. And I said, well, that's, that's kind of weird. So where's the real chicken? No, there's no real chicken. Okay. What other meat do you have? No, we don't have any meat. Okay. Any eggs? And they said, no, no, no. It's a, it's a, you know, vegan restaurant. I was like, well, screw that. You know? And so my buddy, who's about 265, 65, Tom Bunbury is like a big British bodybuilder also lives out here in the States. We just looked at each other and, and walked out, right? So I wouldn't have had a single meal uh, without animal protein in it. And so, you know, this, this gladiator study was not enough to make me change my mind. It was just enough to start really digging into this research. And that's when I sort of realized that I'd been led this myth that you have to have meat to be strong and healthy. And that, um, you know, essentially all protein originates in plants and you can basically go direct to the source and cut out the middleman. So I started experimenting uh, after I'd read a lot more research, talked to a lot more athletes. I started experimenting uh, with a completely plant-based diet. My endurance improved and my strength improved. You know, I wasn't switching from a, like a standard American diet with a bunch of junk food. I was eating like extra lean turkey, uh, chicken. That's what I think is a very valid point. And I find it's very uh, interesting you mentioned that because I think that's where a lot of people use, uh, like from my experience, experience of what I've seen and read that a lot of the research that shows that people have improved their health markers from going on to vegan diets normally because they go from the extreme of eating like a lot of processed shit food essentially yeah, totally. and then they start actually eating greens and obviously they're going to come healthier um, yeah no, I mean that is obviously a part of it right when you switch to any like even if you go on the paleo diet and you see those improvements like what is it is it because you've added in more meat or is it because you've uh, cut out the junk foods as if you've added more plant foods in fact the longest uh study where they did a two-year follow-up on the paleo diet so they had um, improved weight loss they had improved uh, biomarkers in the blood now of course they told them to cut out or elim eliminate or really reduce dairy eliminate or really reduce uh processed foods increase fruits and vegetables and increase their meat consumption now after two years what they found was the only thing that they didn't follow was increased meat consumption. So their pro absolute protein intake stayed right around the same. Well, they cut out dairy and they cut out processed foods and they'd increase fruits and vegetables. To me, that sort of says, well, going in a more plant-based direction and cutting out processed foods was where the benefit was coming from, not from eating lots of meat. So yeah, it's certainly different. To, it's difficult to pass out the details. You know, where is the benefit coming from? And I think with plants, you know, 90% of Americans don't get enough fiber, for example. Yeah. In England, it's probably fairly similar. Um, so I think the benefit is, is by twofold, right? It's, I think it's incorporating more plant foods, um, which is doing two things. It's cutting down on processed foods. And then again, you know, people can disagree on this. I think it's also cutting out, um, you know, some of the meat as well. So I think there's a huge benefit. I think it would be difficult to sort of prove the difference between 90, 95% plant-based 
and 100% plant-based, but I think between like 90, 95% plant-based and only 50% of your calories coming from plants, I think there's really, really strong evidence to, um, to show that. I think, again, it comes down to like what the context and maybe your goals are as well. Like if your goal is optimal health and longevity, whereas it's against maybe like having an aesthetic physique perhaps and like a optimal body composition, and I guess they're probably slightly different in that respect. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. I mean, I think, you know, you know, can things be a little bit more challenging? Um, you know, for example, leucine is a really important amino acid. Yeah, it's like the foreman, right? Telling the other you know, amino acids what to do and build. So it's really important. Research shows that, you know, 1.8 to 2 grams um, every, you know, sort of every meal is probably going to drive that. Now, is that a little bit harder on a plant-based diet? For sure it is. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean just because meat's got um, or whey protein powder or whatever has more leucine in it, that's the best way to go. Because I think there are other things that offset that. So a lot of athletes, over 50% of our athletes um, take supplements, you know, creatine, protein powders, branched chain amino acids. And at the elite level, even more athletes take supplements. So, you know, to say, oh, well, if you have to do a vegan diet, you don't have to supplement with leucine, right? But if you chose to, that doesn't make the diet uh, invalid for those goals. So, you know, when you're trying to optimize your nutrition, I think you have to plan it carefully anyway. So one of the arguments is, or if you're going to do a vegan diet or a plant-based diet, it's got to be really well planned. That sort of insinuates that if you're going to do a, a, a diet that's heavy in meat, you don't have to plan it at all. You can just do whatever you want. And we know that's not true as well. So yeah, I think certainly there's really strong health benefits. If, you're, if you've got certain athletic goals, do you need to dial it in and plan a little bit? Yeah, just like your workout, just like any diet, I do think you have to sort of dial it in a bit. In terms of like uh, some sort of practical information for anyone, so yourself, obviously, when you, you came back through your comeback from UFC after your injuries and bits and pieces, did you supplement leucine and other things like that? Is that something you do currently? Um, so, no. I mean, so I, I actually uh, didn't. I trained for a fight again after I was in my plant-based stage, but I didn't fight again. Oh. So, and the reason was for that was I'd actually uh, I'd broken my neck uh, earlier. And, you know, I trained for a fight. And then as I was training, um, you know, I, I basically hit my head against the wall when I was shooting in on somebody, really hurt my neck again. And I went to get MRIs and I had four experts saying you should really, um, you know, you should statistically okay. significantly higher risk of paralysis, uh, significantly higher risk of paralysis. And so you probably shouldn't fight. And so I haven't actually fought uh, being on a plant based diet, unfortunately. Um, but now I don't really think about, um, I don't think about macronutrients. I don't think about protein. You know, I'm still working out, jujitsu, uh, running steps, lifting some weights, you know, running around with the kids, whatever. You know, and I just, I don't think about those things as much as I would if I was competing, you know, competitively. Do the rest of your uh, family follow a vegan diet out of curiosity? So, yeah, all of the, um, uh, so I, there's four kids with us in the house. My, my wife's got three from the last marriage and we've got two together. The older one is uh, 24, so he lives on his own. He's significantly plant-based, but I don't think 100%. Everyone in the household, 100%. My daughter, who's uh, just turning six soon, never eaten animal products other than, you know, maybe at like uh, a kid's birthday party or something, you know, if there's like cake. Yeah. Um, so, you know, is she vegan? I, you know, I, I don't really like that term vegan. I think the most important thing is getting the vast majority of your calories from plants. And to be fair, that's what I've, I've liked to worry about the conversation. You said that a few times is like primarily rather than like, I think some people do is uh, like you, thou shall never eat anything animal based ever again. Otherwise, yeah, you know, to me, I think that's like, you know, to say it's got to be all or nothing. I think it's silly. If you go on our website, we say it's all or something. Yeah. Um, in any stage. And that's true with For us, that's true with like animal foods versus plant foods. And then within plant foods, whole plant foods versus processed plant foods. If you tell someone you've got to only eat plants and only eat whole plants, I think people are going to have that, a hard time sticking to that. Now, the film, we interviewed, the, the ones that actually show up in interviews, the athletes, yeah. not Arnold. Arnold's not vegan. He's, he doesn't drink milk. He's cut down 80% on dairy. But the athletes that we interviewed, uh, oh, another example would be um, uh, Nate Diaz, who we didn't, we didn't put in as an interview. He doesn't know 100%, right? He does a little bit of seafood, a little bit of eggs. Yeah. But, you know, he's basically plant-based in all regards, but all the others, we made sure that they were 100%. And the reason for that, for including them as being completely vegan, is we didn't want people saying, well, it's the fish that they ate once a month that gives them the protein, or the eggs that they had every couple of weeks. So that was why we wanted to show an extreme to sort of 
shows that you don't have to have meat uh, and um, you know dairy and eggs to be strong and healthy. But in terms of recommendations, at the end of the film, you know Arnold says try one day a week, and Dotsie Bausch, the Olympic cyclist, said it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And I think you know you could have a vegan diet that's really unhealthy, full of Oreos and Pepsi and <laughs> white flour, right? And then on the other hand, you could have someone that was doing like 90% whole plants and having a little bit of wild caught, wild caught salmon. No one could argue that that vegan diet was healthier than the, the one that was like 90% whole plant foods and a bit of salmon. You know what I mean? Yeah. 100%. So, so I'm 100%, and I actually think that there's there's strong enough evidence for me to be 100%. But I think to argue 95 to 100% would be more difficult, and I think it's more nuanced, and I think it takes a long lot longer to unpack. Um, but I think we can see in the film there's athletes doing you know really well on 100% plants. I think it just comes down to common sense. A lot of eventualities. I think some people people are too desperate to polarize things sometimes to get reaction out of people if that makes sense and take things to the extreme where like and take things a little bit out of context which i think a lot of things perhaps with the documentary i think you obviously will have experienced have probably been taking uh further than they probably were meant to come across if that makes sense well yeah i mean i think some people came into the film thinking oh this is a you know before it came out vegan people propaganda. were talking smack on it they're saying oh this is vegan propaganda it's all bs they haven't even seen it mm. and then some of the criticisms are like uh Oh, well, the gladiators, you know, Lane Norton put something out saying the gladi- they said the gladiators were vegan and here's why they weren't vegan. Well, you, you said already at the start of this call that yeah. they, they're primarily plant-based. Which yeah, they, 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 the, the scientist said they were predominantly, didn't even say they were vegetarian, let alone vegan. He said predominantly vegetarian. And I said I was surprised that they ate mostly plants. But then people like spin it out, say, oh, this is a vegan propaganda film. Let's just say that they said they're the gladiators were vegan, but we didn't say that, you know, and then like a lot of people go on, go on to say, not only weren't they were vegan, but they were fat because they were eating a bunch of carbs. But the, the researcher, the other researcher on the project, we actually interviewed him as well. He didn't make the cut. And he said, you know, they were eating a plant-based diet. Uh, and he said, you know, because they were eating all these simple carbohydrates, uh, they were fat. Well, first of all, Barley, and that sort of thing, is not actually a simple carbohydrate. It's a complex carbohydrate. So it shows that he doesn't know much about nutrition. And it was interesting that we found that the experts that we interviewed, they knew a lot about their field, but they didn't know a lot about other fields. So the people in nutrition didn't know a lot about anthropology, and the people at anthropology didn't know enough about archaeology and so forth. So that was merely a hypothesis. It was never any evidence to show that they were fat. Uh, And whether they were fat or not, I mean, there's some... Uh, some things in the literature saying that they would force feed themselves at night, but this notion that they were fat so they could uh, defend themselves better against a knife wounds, I think is just it's like a merely a hypothesis and not proven. And we know that whole, uh, you know, food, food carbohydrates uh, actually don't make you fat. So, um, you know, the white sugar and flour and all the processed carbohydrates, people can tend to lump that in. Um, but there's no evidence that like, you know, eating sweet potatoes and bananas and oats and, pears and you know that type of stuff is you know it doesn't make you fat again i think it gets just taken too much to the extremes i think with certain points with that in terms of actually like practically like implementing a vegan diet what did you personally find the most difficult at the start well first thing oh, is really? i didn't do it over overnight okay. you know so i didn't just jump all in so i cut out red meat yeah uh, and rather thinking about cutting out things i did cut out things but i felt it more like okay let me try like if i'm doing a um, a chili uh, maybe a three bean chili instead of a beef chili, you know. Um, I started incorporating things like lentil pasta instead of whole wheat pasta because, you know, there's more protein in it. Um, and also when you turn um, legumes into a flour, it doesn't affect their glycemic index in the same way that it affects the glycemic index if you grind a whole wheat into a flour. So I started incorporating different things. And over like six weeks or a couple of months, I sort of cut things out. Um, and it was, you know, it's challenging to start with when you've eaten the same way at least three times a day for your whole life to suddenly start switching over. Um, it's not the easiest thing, right? And especially when you're traveling, if you're not used to it. But I think uh, over time, you just sort of gradually make switches and uh, incorporate new dishes and, that you like. And I feel like there's a lot more, a lot more variety now. You know, I thought, well, what am I going to eat? But I used to eat extra lean turkey chicken, brown rice, broccoli, uh, pretty much most of the time, occasionally some beef. The bro food. The bro foods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, that was sort of what 
by how I believed. Um, and then towards the end of that, before I went uh, plant-based, actually, before I came across the gladiator study, I'd actually switched to more like grass-fed beef because of the omega-6, omega-3 ratio. I switched to air-chilled chicken instead of, uh, in England, they don't, um, they air chilled chicken anyway, but in the States, they dip it in chlorine, which is about 50 times the strength of uh, what's in, your, in someone's swimming pool. And that's uh, by the European Union, that's uh, known as a carcinogen. So in the States, it's pretty hard to find air chilled chicken like they, they do in England. And actually the export of poultry was banned into Europe from the United States for that reason. So I started switching to air chilled chicken, which was a bit cleaner and you know, they were, the chickens were roaming around and getting sunlight. And so that meat was probably a bit better. Um, and so that was sort of my diet before, um, but I, I find there's a lot more variety now. Um, and, and yeah. That's one of the big things that is obviously discussed in terms of a meat-based diet versus vegan diet in terms of obviously toxicity of say some meat products versus uh, obviously plants. Plants, again, it comes down to, I guess, the quality of the produce you're going to be eating. So you're eating wild deer, for example, venison versus a, like a battery hen. It's like a completely different animal. Yeah, it's different. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a couple of things. There's a couple of principles in my mind. One is um, that you should always get the nutrients as low on the food chain as possible. Because as you go up the trophic levels, you get bioaccumulation in the body of the animal. And then you get biomagnification as you go up the food chain. So for example, the largest fish have about up to a million times more mercury per gram than the surrounding water. Because the, you know, the small fish eat the, the smallest fish and then the medium fish, you know. Yeah. And so this happens also with pesticides. We see that... Um, meat and eggs and, and fish have a lot more pesticides than plant foods. You know, if people are worried about the pesticides sprayed on plant foods, you know that animals are basically typically eating um, food that isn't fit for human consumption. So there's allowed to be sprayed with more pesticides and this bioaccumulates. Same with uh, PCBs and furans, these, um, these toxins and toxicants that are basically, um, they ba don't biodegrade essentially and they build up. So yeah, you're going to have better, like, on the Joe Rogan podcast that I did the debate the other day, I pointed out that if you take wild caught kangaroo meat, right? I haven't seen anything done on, on wild caught elk, but you look at the inflammatory markers, uh, CRP, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, these are like markers in the blood for inflammation. And they had about half the inflammation um, as you would get from coming from beef, like sort of regular beef. So I definitely think there's some sort of natural elements, like if you're not having the antibiotics and the hormones and that type of thing, and the, the unnatural diet that's fed to, you know, the vast majority of cattle and chickens and so forth. But you're also, um, I also believe based on the evidence that I've seen that there's naturally occurring, um, you know, mediators in animal foods that aren't good. So I do, do not think that having lots of heme iron is good people don't realize that there's trans fats that naturally occurring in meat and dairy. And studies have shown that it doesn't really matter if it's coming from par partially hydrogenated vegetable oil or from ruminants, that trans fats is still uh, harmful. And, you know, it's basically recommended that you get 0% of calories from trans fats. A lot of people don't realize uh, that that's also a source of trans fat. Yeah, it's amazing how things carry up, carry up the food chain and it sort of escalates from there onwards in that respect. Yeah. And, and, and people don't realize that sometimes, you know, cows are fed fish meal as well. Yeah. You now, with all the toxins that are in that fish, but then getting into the animal foods. So I just don't see any reason to get the nutrients from higher up in the food chain. I think it's better to get as low in the food chain, like fish oil, for example. You know, a lot of people eat fish because they want the omega-3s, DHA and EPA, like the preformed. So some people would say, well, you can just take, you know, ALA from flaxseed or walnuts and it'll convert. Some people don't convert that, but there's been a study showing looking at fish oils and in many of the toxins, even though they claim to be toxin free, they had just as many uh, toxins as the fish oils that didn't claim to be toxin free. So why not take an algae oil, which is where the fish got it from. You can still get the preformed DHA and EPA, but without the bioaccumulation of toxins. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, so coming up through the food chain again. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of obviously like, research of the food industry in itself is a bit of a shambles in terms of obviously it's driven as the world is solely by money so nothing is ever sure. what, it, what it says it can what it says it is like do you think there'll be much more in terms of research going forward that might be a bit more like not biased to one side to either side or the other for depending on who puts the studies out if that makes sense it's almost like they need like an intermediary to come in and with without an agenda 
trying to push either the vegan side of things or sure. the side of things, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's research showing that um, industry-funded research in food and beverage is four to eight times more likely to find um, the outcome in the favor of the people that funded it, right? So I think but you do have to look... Say what? Well, the tobacco industry or alcohol, I guess. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we see that with the sugar industry, like funded by Pepsi and Coca-Cola, and then we also see it with the meat industry. I mean, I think the meat industry just has a lot more money than like broccoli or lentils. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think that if you're going to look at the studies, even if you look at a meta-analysis, I think we have to, of, of a certain type of disease, I think we've really got to look at all those studies and say, okay, which one of these were funded by industry and should we really take that, um, you know, should we take that with a bit of a grain of salt because it was clearly funded by industry and they only put out that research because it was in their favor. They didn't even have to put that research out. So there's a lot of studies that are done where the research isn't even published because it didn't find the results that the funder wanted. But yeah, I think we have to be careful whether it's the sugar industry or the, you know, white flour. I just don't think you're getting that. Certainly there's some, um, there was one, one done by the avocado board. And they actually, we used that in the film. Um, we didn't use it to talk about the benefit of avocado, but yeah. they were showing how it would, uh, we showed it to just show the inflammation that happens when you eat a burger by itself. Um, and so I do think we have to be careful taking those studies as, um, you know, being fact. Um, but I just don't think, you know, if it's, if it's anything, it's the dairy and meat industry that have had all the money and the influence, not just for studies, but also influencing uh, people in the government to make certain recommendations. You know, it's clear that like, you know, a lot of these people are on the payroll uh, making these government recommendations from the meat and dairy industry. And that just doesn't happen from the fruit and vegetable industry. 100% and one I would definitely like personally for myself, I'd recommend to people generally a balanced diet of all food groups and macronutrients. Yeah. Uh, my personal approach with the clients who work with me are generally looking for like body composition goals. But I do 100% agree in terms of the dairy side of things. I think that is um, just a can of worms. I think the dairy industry, and I just can't see any yeah. value in like the human body for most, like 70% of people, 75% of people that can't digest lactose particularly well anyway and causes huge right. amount of issues. So like for me, personally, that's one thing I, I think nearly everyone could do without. Yeah, well, di the dietitians of Canada, I mean, they, the government recommendations in Canada, they just took dairy off um, as a food group completely. It's not even a food group anymore in Canada. So I think we'll see other, you know, countries follow. It's, it's interesting though. You have like, I think it's like the American food boards or whatever it is who are recommending everyone to drink a glass of milk a day for calcium and things yeah. like that. I think it's three, yeah. well, they were saying three, three servings a day. And if you look at the bottom of the handout that registered dietitians get in America through the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, it says at the bottom funded by the National Dairy Council. So literally on there and, and it's pretty overt. So that's the problem, right? Is that the education of registered dietitians is getting impacted by industry and the dairy industry, you know, I would say above the meat industry has had a very powerful hold. The Got Milk campaign uh, in America was one of the greatest marketing campaigns of all time. Uh, so I think we have to take those, that marketing and the studies into account when formulating our decisions. 100%. In terms of some like practical uh, information in regards to obviously vegan diets. So say for example, anyone who's looking to try and turn vegan, but wants to obviously focus maybe on more body composition goals, are any foods you would personally use yourself in terms of when you're looking to try and drop weight, maybe trying to keep the carbohydrates down, but keep protein intake up, which are in terms yeah, of- Yeah, it's really interesting, right? Because that sort of traditional bodybuilding role mm. is like when you're trying to cut the fat, you'll keep the protein pretty high, you'll keep the carbs low and you keep the fat, you know, maybe pretty high or, or sort of medium. So it's interesting. I do know that there's vegans doing that. Yeah. Um, and when they do that, they're doing more like tofu and nuts and seeds and they do some of the fake, you know, the meat analogs, yeah. which again, I don't think is the healthiest thing. Well, so like there are people doing corn, that. Like that. Uh, corn, yeah, we don't have that in America, but yeah, there's certain things like that. Um, so some people sort of do it that way. Um, but there are a lot of people now like, you, you know, uh, Barney DuPlessis? Yeah. Who's, uh, who was Mr. Universe. So he'll, um, my understanding is he'll do quite a bit of carbohydrates, low fat, and, you know, re pretty high protein. So, and there's a number of athletes over here that have done that before. Um, I'm just trying to, like, Nimai Delgado, who's in the film, who's on the cover of Muscle and Fitness. Again, he's, like, more yeah. men's physique uh, rather than, like, you know, actual bodybuilding category. But I know that he's done it before, too, where he's on quite a bit of carbs. 
um, low fat and uh, you know high protein. So I think there's different ways of doing it. When you when you do the sort of low carb, high fat, then I think you're going to see people doing more of the meat analogs. Yeah. Um, and more protein powders. When you do the other way, again, a lot of bodybuilders are still doing protein powder anyway. But they, yeah, I think, when you go a higher carb, low fat, you can um, still get really, really lean um, uh, doing a lot of whole foods. What do you use as your own your, your own personal like main uh, food choices in terms of protein sources? So I do quite a lot of legumes. So um, you know, beans, peas. Like even in my smoothie this morning, right? So. My smoothie is uh, 750 calories and 35 grams of protein. Okay. Um, with no, there's, there's no protein powder in it. What was in this magic smoothie then, James? Well, I don't think most people would like it, and it took me a while <laughs> to. Like, there's quite a bit of greens in it, you know what I mean? And if you didn't, Thick. if you weren't, it t- I wouldn't. If I had jumped into that on day one, I would have thought this is pretty gross. But I've yeah. sort of come adapted to it. So it has um it has a cup of soy milk. Okay. It has um, a tablespoon of flaxseed, tablespoon of hemp seed, tablespoon of pumpkin seed. Uh, one cup of greens, one cup of mixed berries and cherries, uh, one cup of peas, actually, frozen peas, I just throw in there, um, half a cup of uh, oats, one Brazil nut for the selenium. <laughs> yeah, a bit of amla, which is like Indian gooseberry powder. It's like what, the highest uh, sort of antioxidant yeah. food you can get. Um, add some water in there, one banana. Of course, if you wanted the calories to come down and the protein still stay high, you could pull 100 calories out from the banana. Um, what else? That's about it. I'm thinking, yeah, so that's about it. And it's, yeah, 750 calories, 35 grams of protein. But again, I, I sometimes will have, you know, if I have a, a meal or I've had a, you know, I've worked out and I don't feel like I've had that much protein, sometimes I have some like, you know, organic pea protein yeah. um, powder, but it's not every day. You know, it's like if I feel like, oh, I didn't hit, um, you know, I didn't get a ton of, but again, I'm not trying to build maximal muscle you know, it's not like the goal, my goal. Um, but it's still, you know, you can still get 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight eating, you know, whole foods if you're careful. I think the hardest thing is, is if you, let's say you're, a, you're an office worker and you sit at your office chair all day and you got 40 pounds of fat to lose. Um, so you need to be in a caloric deficit. So let's say you need to lose one pound a week. You're going to go 500 caloric deficit a day right, to get the 3,500 caloric deficit a week, which is yeah. one pound of fat. That's when I think you're going to, if you're going to, in terms of maintaining or keeping your muscle up, I think that's when protein powder is going to come in handy, especially because you're not working out as much as you should do. You need to be in a caloric deficit anyway. So your, your caloric needs go down, but your protein needs didn't go down. In fact, in caloric deficit, your protein needs go, go up, up, my most research, right? because of gluconeogenesis, your, your protein is getting used in some way to, to build for energy. Fuel, yeah. Yeah, for fuel. So you're sort of robbing from that, um, the building blocks to use as fuel, so your protein requirements go up. So that is a case in particular where I think, yeah, that person's probably gonna wanna take some protein powder to keep their protein up while keeping their calories down. Because on a vegan diet, if you did all whole foods at like 2000 calories a day, and you're like a, you know, uh, you got your way 90 kilos or whatever, it's going to be hard to get that protein in. Um, you know, so you do have to manage uh, things like that. I think that's one, like, it's an interesting point talking about the, the standard office worker who's got to lose maybe 30 to 40 pounds is because I think a lot of people like to go, say, for example, fully vegan is a big, it's a completely like abstract change in com- like, entire life. If you've never even been on a diet and trying to lose weight, I think that's probably too right. much of an extreme to go to in one full sweep. Whereas I think maybe going to like, a, as you've said before, maybe just eating, maybe like bring in 50% more plants and phase your diet in that respect. Yeah. You'll get on rather than trying to do something yeah, totally. for three days and then you probably give up and then you go back to square one, which is what a lot of people I think do when they try stuff. No, totally. I think jumping in overnight, it works well for some people. And I know people that have lost like 250 pounds yeah. and have piped it off and then now they can run and, do everything you want to do so i know there's a lot of people that do jump in but i think like the majority of people should probably do it gradually and also i don't think people should go okay i'm going vegan forever now you should just try it whatever the stage whether it's all in or just you know 20 percent or 30 percent more plants you know cutting out that junk food increasing your whole plant food consumption try it and see how you do you don't i think it's not good mentally to go okay i'm never going to be able to have a steak again i'm never going to you know I have the same now, argument. 
keto as well. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, totally. Um, but now for me, I don't even crave it. I like, I don't even see, I don't even see animal foods as food anymore. Yeah. You know, I just like, I, I just think there's that opportunity cost of getting more plant foods in. I don't think it's necessary. Um, but I agree for some, for a lot of most people jumping, diving in overnight is, is not going to be a good idea. They just see how they do. And we know that, they, you know, it's, you've got to meet people where they're at. So if we're eating a bunch of processed crap, and we just get them eating more fruits and vegetables, I think that's, you know, that's a benefit. It's like a different question, but in terms of obviously, obviously from the UK originally, we, I've spent a bit of time in the US last year and it will be a lot next year. Do you, like, every time I go over there, I'm shocked at terms of the obesity levels and the food, the way they eat, not the way they eat, the way the American culture is in terms of eating is, uh, is something quite else in a lot of respects in terms of the, the poor quality food that's available like for me, it's almost like it's typical, like American capitalism in terms of you've got the best solutions in the world with the best gyms, the best fitness equipment, like the best supplements. Then you've also got the devil of the evil of like fast food, absolutely everywhere, like rammed down your throat, and everything's laden massively with calories, fats, and rubbish. And as you said, even like say for example, like chicken, which is supposed to be healthy, a lot of it's like cleaned in chlorine, which is basically killing you. Right, totally. Well, I think there's a number of issues. One is that the government subsidized animal foods below the cost of production. Mm. And then you've got, um, so for example, a, a McDonald's hamburger that costs $5 should actually cost $15 if you took everything into account. So even the food that is fed to animals is so, sold below cost of production. So that's one thing. Then you've got all like this corn syrup and all this other stuff that they're adding into food, like white flour, that's like cheap, yeah. you know, white sugar, it's cheap. So that goes in the food. Um, and then you've got this problem with like, you know, people's brains are wired to reward, a reward system in your brain that's saying, hey, this is good. So fat, sugar, and salt, there's a brain pathway that's going, yeah, this is really good. Interestingly, there's no uh, reward pathway for protein, um, which sort of is evident that like protein was quite abundant in, in history and that there was no drive to get it. But for fat, sugar, and salt, um, there's a drive. So in, in our distant past, we would be seeking out those types of foods. So now, unfortunately, we've got a reward pathway in our brain that sort of favors us for finding lots of calories and fat, sugar, and salt. Uh, but it's in a world where there's abundant calories and we can buy whatever we want. So we've got cheap food, right, that's subsidized um, and then that's highly calorically dense and low micronutrient value. Then we've got this reward pathway in our brain. And I think that's like a recipe for disaster. You know, so again, and it's not, I, just, I know that the film sort of goes after animal foods, but we both recognize that all the, you know, the processed junk food made from plants is also really bad sodas and, you know, there's like a bunch of shitty oil and, um, you know, white flour and all these junk foods. That's obviously bad as well. Um, so I think it's like a really bad recipe when you've got subsidized foods, making it really cheap and then, a, a, you know, a pathway in your brain telling you that it's good for you. Um, so you've got to get people out of that loop, you know. Well, I've never really thought about it in that respect. I think the whole system in the US is set up there. It's just like ultimately it's a lack of education from school upwards. And the same in the UK, though, no one's actually taught correctly how to eat or how to look right. after yourself, which is like seems like a basic fundamental. Was probably the first thing you should teach people at school, which for me right. just seems so wrong. But I, I can't see it changing anytime soon. I don't think. Right. No, I don't think so either. Um, I mean, there is a shift now at least in the States, and I think worldwide, towards more lifestyle medicine. Mm -hmm. So rather than just like, thinking of prescribing drugs, people are looking at diet, of which they're suggesting predominantly plants. They're looking at sleep, making sure that people get enough sleep and enough quality sleep. Uh, they're looking at exercise, right? And they're looking at not smoking uh, and stress as well. So like really limiting your stress. So I think those things, people, there is a shift towards that, like the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, of lifestyle medicine and they've got like 16 partner organizations around the world that their numbers are significantly increasing in fact they actually accredited the film as an ongoing medical education resource uh, because they reviewed the science and they think that it's uh credible as did the defense health agency of the united states which yeah, yeah. looked after the department of defense and what they're eating so i think there is a shift um but i think it's going to take a bit of time before it really catches on um but we know that, like these underlying causes of disease could be prevented by these lifestyle changes and one of the largest things portions of that is people's diets yeah 100 in terms of obviously we'll start to wrap things up there so i don't want to keep you too long james in terms of obviously 
the, the what's next for you? Is there a Game Changer sequel coming or something else yeah. in the pipeline? He's smiling. Yeah, no, never, uh, never another documentary. I mean, we've got 600 hours of footage and we made a 90 minute film. So we'd like to keep putting that out maybe on social media and on the website and on YouTube. Um, we basically, you know, five out of six people that go meet free end up going back. Yeah. So number one reason is actually social pressure because people are sort of giving them a hard time uh, for eating like a plant. Would you say, I'd say that not with people who just go on a diet in general is that people give up because people around them are like, oh, have a bit of cake, have this. You don't. Yeah, eat. no, that's, yeah, definitely. It makes the other person feel insecure and bad because they can't do it. It does, right. It's like if you don't drink, right, and someone's out there drinking yeah. alcohol, you know, they're like, come on, just have a couple. And sometimes people cave in. So no, I think that social pressure is probably a big thing for any diet. But I think it's even like, it goes out of proportion when it's uh, meat, because especially yeah. amongst young guys, they're like, come on, what are you doing eating a tofu salad? You know, you got to eat a steak. And so um, there's that. But the second reason is people not having the resources. So what we're doing on GameChangersMovie.com is putting out recipes, shopping tips, tips on how to make the transition. Uh, we want to have a Facebook community page that we're building so people can ask questions. So that's what my goal at the minute is, uh, is sort of building those resources for people, keep putting out more tips and recipes. And that, that's my goal at the moment. Obviously, I'm getting a lot of speaking requests and, and screening requests, but uh, that's, that's my goal in the short term. Yeah, I think that's a great resource and a great idea because I think that's the main challenge most people have is like, how the hell am I going to eat? Like, what am I going to eat? It's the first question that like, I hear from people. Right. Uh, yeah. you providing more education and knowledge base around that is a superb thing to do and will help a lot of people who decide to make that switch and give it a try yeah and the, and the thing is like if it's just one meal you know like try a meal and then you start saying oh i like that meal i could have that once a week and now with my wife and i there's probably like 70 or 80 recipes that yeah. we've had at home where i go oh we should have this we should we should have this once a week and i'm like wait a minute there's not enough days in the week you know so what's your what's um, your favorite uh meal of interest don't say the smoothie. No. Uh, <laughs> favorite thing I think is uh, is a lentil cottage pie. Okay. Um, that my wife makes. That's really good. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's my favorite. Maybe lentils. It's got like uh, she makes. Uh, my wife makes this one uh, with um, instead of just mashed potato, it's also got mashed cauliflower in there, and you can't really tell the difference. Like fifty fifty, and uh, that tricks the kids too to eating some cauliflower. Uh, but yeah, I really like it. I have interest, do you try to limit your fast, like high glycemic carbohydrates as well on a vegan diet or are you not too bothered? Um, so you're very fit yeah. and healthy anyway. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, there's a, from the research that I've seen, like once you're, you know, if your body fat's fairly low and your BMI is fairly low, like it doesn't seem like the higher glycemic, um, you know, so I eat dates and bananas and you know, types of fruit, but, but not, you know, again, it's, to me, it's more about hot, rather than think people are thinking like, People often confuse carb, um, complex with simple, whereas to me it's more like whole and then like heavily processed, you know, yeah, so, you know, and again, when I, when I put my banana in my smoothie and I blend it, I'm also changing the glycemic index and glycemic load. And it doesn't seem to, uh, I don't seem to put on fat or, I, I do think for people that are overweight, they should probably, as they're losing weight, they should probably go with um, lower glycemic uh, carbs. But, you know, David Jenkins, who developed the glycemic index, also advocates a fully plant-based diet. So I think that's, that's pretty interesting as well. Fascinating. Fascinating. So if you had one tip for anyone who was to finish things up for anyone who's looking to go vegan, what would you say? What's the big thing to give it a try? I think I would just, um, I would incorporate it slowly. Okay. And I would say, make sure you can't just take the meat off your plate and eat what's left, right? Then you're going to start losing weight. You'll be low in calories. You'll be low in protein. You've got to try and think of, things that are, you know, especially if you're trying to work out and build muscle, find foods that you like that are sort of relatively high in protein, like beans, peas, lentils, nuts, and seeds. And again, people go, oh, broccoli has all this protein. Well, that's sort of, it's misleading because it's got a lot of protein per calorie, but you'd have to eat like this much broccoli. You, you, just, you die trying to eat it, basically. Yeah, yeah. So some vegans make sort of ridiculous arguments, but, you know, beans, peas, lentils, nuts, and seeds, they're pretty calorically dense. They've got a decent amount of protein. And I would make sure that people are getting those types of foods in their diet. Awesome. Awesome. Absolute pleasure to have you on the uh, podcast, James. It was a fascinating conversation and I'm sure we'll get plenty of interesting feedback on this. So pleasure. Thank you so much and I uh, wish you the best with everything going forward. Awesome. Yeah, thank thanks you. for your time. Thank you. Bye.